Uh, okay, so uh, welcome to this week's uh, lunchtime lecture here at uh, o the Open Data Institute. Um, I have the pleasure of introducing this week's lunchtime lecture. Uh, my name is Jamie Fawcett. I'm a researcher here at the ODI, and I'm pretty excited about this one. Um, today, uh, Rikesh Shah from TFL is going to be taking us through uh, their open data uh, program the challenges they face and the lessons they've learned, uh, having done open data for 10 years. Um, what I would ask is that we hold questions until the uh, end, where there'll be a lot of time to take questions, both in the room, but also on Twitter. So if you are watching the live stream, uh, if you could uh, tweet using the hashtag ODI Fridays, uh, we'll be able to try and get some of these um, questions going. And if we could try and fill up this side as much as possible, please. And always last minute. And I will hand over to you, Rakesh. Thank you. Thanks, Jamie. Okay. So, so good uh, good afternoon, all. As, as Jamie said, I'm Rakesh Shah from Transport for London. I'm the head of commercial innovation there. I've also got my colleague Theo Chapel here, who's worked with me on a lot of the open data activity. In terms of today, I'll probably focus on two main areas. One is, as Jamie said. TFL's open data journey over the last 10 years, um, and, but also how do we start moving into better engaging with startups and SMEs to create even more value for, for the city? So There's probably two main components to, to today's session. Okay. So firstly, to give you an overview of Transport for London, uh, we're the integrated transport authority in, in the capital. We're responsible for around 7 million bus journeys every day, around 5 million journeys on the tube network, we're responsible for around 10,000 buses uh, that, that, that franchised uh, in, in the capital. We also manage every single traffic light in, in London. We also have responsibility for the key strategic roads in London called the TLRN, the Transport for London Road Network. Um, and we're also responsible for lots of other assets, whether it's the Docklands Light Railway, the tram network. We also regulate the taxi and private hire trade in London. And we're also responsible for 40,000 trees. So I guess from a data point of view, it can be quite exciting that there's so many different data points uh, on, in our infrastructure, which we'll talk about in more detail. I think, I think before moving on, on into the open data story, just, just to give some con uh, context around Transport for London uh, in today's, today's state. So firstly, the financial reality for us is, is a real one at the moment. So we have a fares freeze. And the government has also recently withdrawn our grant, the operational grant, to run the network. So as a result, we've got um, s uh, uh, very serious uh, financial pressures uh, in, uh, to, run, to run transport in the capital. Uh, in, in parallel, there, there is a, we've got challenges around population growth. So by 2041, we expect the population in London to reach 10.5 million which is 28% higher than what it was in, in 2011. And transport has a big role to play to move, to, to move people around. Um, thirdly, the rising expectations of our, of our customers. Customers want more. So we're, we're running longer operating hours. You know, Night Tube is, is relatively a new introduction to the capital. Um, and we're also soon to introduce the Elizabeth Line, which will carry a significant amount of capacity from East London to West London. Also, with Brexit and, and other uncertainties, that has an impact. So whether it's tourism, uh, it has an impact on our, on our business plan. Then, then moving on. So Sadiq Khan has uh, published the draft transport, the, the mayor's draft transport, the draft mayor's transport strategy. Sorry, I get that right, uh, and that will be out uh, as a full tr uh, mayor's transport strategy l later this year. But in the strategy, in the draft strategy, we've asked a series of questions, which include, you know, what should London be like as a city? How can a city like London be made for everyone? And in particular, what role could transport play to, in making a better London a reality? And uh, that's quite important, particularly from a street's point of view, where most of our travel happens. Most of our travel, uh, most of our travel, 80% of it is in, a, is in a public space. Or TFL is responsible for that. So moving on. An ambitious target has been set out by the Mayor. By 2041, he wants 80% of Londoners to either walk, cycle or use public transport. And, and that's a shift from 26.7 million daily trips to 32 
uh, million daily trips. So that's quite a big shift in terms of daily trips that we need to convert. Um, some of the context is traffic dominance is causing us danger and there's an issue around air, po air pollution as well. Congestion holds back the economy. Um, also two people are f being active in their, da in their daily, daily behaviours, particularly around uh, walking or cycling. Um, so inactivity causes uh, health problems. Um, people are also using private, uh, private transport much more uh, uh, than public transport. And neighbourhoods that are planned for car use with low density housing and a, and a poor mix of amenities, both of which limit housing and jobs growth in the, in the city. So clearly our dependency on car usage uh, needs, 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 needs to change, where people are more active and, and using sustainable forms of transport. So three key themes have been set out. The first one is around healthier streets and healthier people. 75% of current car journeys could be made via, via walking, cycling or public transport. Um, so we need to redefine how we plan our streets and, and the transport network in the, in the city. We need to uh, look at areas such as how do we tackle the growth in freight? You know, people with changes in technology and internet shopping. Uh, how do we consolidate freight movement in the city? Um, how do we, uh, how do we, how do we uh, work with boroughs to focus on some of the traffic reduction strategies? The second key theme focuses on a good public transport experience in the city. So we've already delivered Crossrail 1 or the Elizabeth Line uh, later this year, which will increase rail capacity by 10%. Which is the largest increase since the Second World War. We're already very committed, and we publicly said this: uh, committed to Crossrail 2, uh, and we want we want to ensure that the UK has highly skilled and a competitive economy that benefits people across the UK, not just in London. And our plans are to create over 200,000 new jobs, mm. as well as 60,000 supply chain jobs and 18,000 apprenticeships uh, as part of Crossrail 2. And the final theme focuses on new homes and jobs. So with the, with, I've spoken about the population growth. So as travel demand increases, and we anticipate this to be 4.4 billion journeys a year by 22-23. So it's a significant amount, which is an 11% increase just within five years. So you can see the demand for our services is significant. Um, and also in London, there are problems around finding s suitable and affordable housing. So how do we develop new schemes, schemes that unlock l areas of London? And one area is um, the Northern Line and Bakerloo Line extensions. We've also spoken about the Barking Riverside expansion program too. Um, so part of this is how, how, do we, how does TfL's property development estate as a, as a large landowner help deliver new homes in London, particularly focusing on affordable housing? So then mo moving the debate, I guess, more towards open data is Anything we do should be customer-centric, and even our open data journey has started with a focus on, on the customer. So when we engage with customers across London, and we have many, many here today, is you know, what, what, we want to understand, what we want them to understand is what we stand for. And there's three things that customers also want from us. And one is every journey matters. So whatever journey you make, whether it's by walking, cycling, or whether it's on the tube or the bus network, it's important we get every, every journey right. Apologies and deliver the right customer experience, whether you're going to school, whether you're going to a hospital appointment, or whether you're going to work. The second part is value for money. Customers want value for money. And that's why Sadiq has introduced a fares freeze. We also have a hopper ticket now on the bus network, which means you can make more journeys uh, in, in the hour. And finally, which is where open data comes in, customers want London to be progressive and innovative. And you know, many of us around the room here today, when we go overseas, we're very defensive about our transport network in, in some cases, particularly London, because we're proud of the city that, that, that we live in. And, and what we're trying to do is then ultimately build trust. And the innovation point is open data's changed and, and, and ch you know, had a massive impact in London positively. But, but other areas include contactless ticketing. You know, we're one of the largest merchants of contactless ticketing in Europe. And another area is uh, just the Victoria Line. Recently, we've upgraded the Victoria Line service, where now you get up around 30, I believe it's 36 trains an hour on the Victoria Line, which, which genuinely is world class compared to any other metro system in the world. So it, it, we need to be innovative to, 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 to support London's agenda. So, so, so even moving closer now towards open data, customers are mobile dependent. And these stats were from two years ago. 
And where we are now is 75% of uh, visits that we get to TFL services, the TFL website, is from a mobile, mobile phone. So which suggests that and indicates very strongly that customers want information on the move. Customers want to in interact with transport services whilst they're on the move. Whereas maybe eight to nine years ago, it was much more of a 50-50 balance where people were planning their journeys on their desktop rather than as, as they are now. If you're wa wondering what the other is, I think the other is probably uh, Xbox or uh, some of the other devices. Right. <coughs> so, mobility, how, 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 how is it being consumed in terms of the information? So, 81% of Londoners use a smartphone. 83% uh, of them are spending time when, uh, on an app when using a smartphone. And this is the interest, the main stat today probably is, actually the next one is 83% of Londoners use TFL's website and 42% of Londoners are using an app powered by TFL data, which, which is very interesting. We also have about 5 million followers on, uh, on Twitter as well. So, and I'll come on to some of the stats uh, later on, but what do we mean by open data? So the first thing is we have to define open data and, and we talk to other transit systems across the world, other public sector bodies. We don't give every, sing every single piece of data that we have. So uh, we have a very strong caveats in place that legally we, we have to be fully compliant and make sure that we're, we're protecting the privacy rights of every single user on our network. Secondly, we don't just make data available. If technically it's very complicated and expensive, we think about whether we should make it available. And thirdly, we do not give any commercially sensitive data away. So we go through a very, very robust process when, when we decide what data we're making available. I think we need to d define what we mean by open data, and that's particularly a conversation with other transit authorities that we're trying to, trying to do, uh, enable that and, and define that. Secondly, our principle we have is we don't charge for open data. So we make it, f it's very easy to access our data. Uh, and if you went onto TFL, dot uh, api dot gov dot uk you can you can uh, api dot tfl dot gov dot uk thank you Theo uh, and you can access the data immediately so so it's a level playing field everyone can access the data um, it's simple to access we don't put in lots of conditions uh, and finally it's available in multiple formats and I'll come on to this in more detail but it's important that we make the data available in the format that the user wants it in so why do we have open data Firstly, it supports our transparency goals. So we want to make uh, our data available and, 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 and be open about uh, our data. Secondly, reach. So I've touched on this point about 42% of Londoners using that powered by TFL data. Well, what that means is a customer can engage with TFL information through their channel of choice. If you're a regular Twitter user or you're a regular Apple Maps user, well, we don't want to necessarily force you onto tfl.gov.uk if that's the way you want the information. Thirdly, it helps us develop niche products. So I'll come on, to, uh, come on to it in a second, but we have about nearly 700 apps. Well, it's about 675 apps powered by TFL data at last count. Well, that means that you've got a wide variety of products out there in the market. So you don't necessarily have to go through TFL's website and search for the information that you want, that you need. Um, also, there's an economic benefit, and I will, I will come on to this in the next slide in, in much more detail. And finally, it drives innovation. So by us making that data available out there, people are allowed to play with it and, and develop new products and services that are incredibly innovative. And having 600 odd apps out there, is some, an organization, any organization wouldn't have 600 apps out there. Um, so it does drive innovation from the marketplace. And we've seen examples where we release the data and within three days we see a proof of concept. And within a couple of months after that, it might be on the Apple Store or on Android Play Store. So the speed is incredible too. So, fun, uh, so I, I touched on economic benefits in the last slide. And this will be really hard to read, so apologies. But what, what we try to do is we try to define or quantify the value of open data to London. And, and we focused on three main categories. What's the value to the city as a whole? What's the value to TfL? And what's the value to the customer? And uh, some econometric models were used, and the number that uh, was that came out was it's a value of up to 130 million pounds per year by us making our open data available. <coughs> and I know this is an it's, it's a struggle in the industry to quantify the value of open data, so so we we really want, wanted to do that. And with the, from a customer point of view, we focus on time. 
the time saved by you receiving that information is a productivity. And as I said, there's an econometric model there that, that do, has a value for every minute that you've been waiting at a bus stop, for example. Secondly, in terms of the value to London, uh, the, the value is in terms of jobs created. So all these apps that I've mentioned, uh, some of them are based in London. So it's supporting the Tech London agenda, that London is open agenda, where people are creating new businesses. And finally, f from a Transport for London point of view, it's enabled us to develop new partnerships. And as a result of those partnerships, we we're able to create more value for London. So one area is data partnerships. We, we have a partnership, which I'll talk about in more detail, but we have a partnership with Waze, where they give us data back, uh, which helps us run our uh, road network even more efficiently. Right, <coughs> so what type of data do we make available? Um, we, have, uh, we have thousands of types of data. So we have th thousands of bits of data, if not millions of bits of data. But at a high level, we have 200 elements, and I would say there's probably 80 different data feeds that, 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 that would make available. And they range from where is your bus uh, right now, so bus arrivals. So you, many of you are probably waiting at a bus stop saying, when will my next bus turn up? Um, where's the tube? You know, and, uh, where specifically is the tube and what type of tube service is it? Especially if you're on the district line where you might have three or four, br three branches. Um, cycle hire docking stations supporting our active travel agenda, the healthier streets agenda. How many bikes are available at a particular docking station? Should I walk there or should I go to the other one? River boats, we also have status updates and, 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 and ar arrivals. Similarly with the overground, the rail and the tram network. We also have a journey planner. So if you think about uh, a journey planner feed, so if you think about an area like Victoria Station or Liverpool Street Station, <coughs> you've got multiple transport modes there. You might have a docking station, you might have a bus network, you might have a rail network, you might have a tube network and other modes. Well, you need to bring all of that data together to, to, for people to develop products, otherwise it makes it much more difficult for an app developer mm -hmm. to bring different feeds in. And finally, an area that we take incredibly seriously is 14% of Londoners have an accessibility need. It's important that we provide the right information and something that we're focusing on right now, which enables developers to develop products that, that highlight whether the lift is available, whether uh, how many steps we might have at a particular station. So that's an area we're currently focusing on. Other areas that we look at beyond uh, pu public transport would be the road network. So earlier I said we're responsible for the Transport for London road network, which is 580 kilometres of the main roads in the capital. Well incidents take place on that road network. People want to pre-plan their journey. So what we do now is we have a, is it a 30 second, is it every 30 seconds we update the feed? Um, we usually about three to four minutes. Okay, sorry, sorry. So, 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 th thank you. So every three to four minutes we update the feed on the road network, which again allows people to create new products and pre-plan their journey. Mm. So, cycling, so we, we're soon to make, we've already started to make some cycling information available, such as the docking station. We're starting to make some cycle route information available, and we want to do more, more in that space. Air quality is a big area of focus, so we're currently using the King's College feed, so it's not just TFL data. We're starting to bring partnership, partner da data in as well. So King's, Co King's College has a data feed which highlights level of air quality in different boroughs in London. And then beyond that, we're also looking at safety, whether it's road safety, bus safety, um, and, and, and other forms of uh, disruption on our network. We also have a jam cam feed, which, uh, which actually gives us people a visual view of what actually what's going on the road network. So it's a different type of data. <coughs> right. And the way we do it all is, is we have it all in a unified API. So what this means is the data is consistently organized. It's easy to find. It, we provide the data in the format that's needed. And we make it easy. Essentially, the principle is let's make it easy for people to develop a product. And because all of the data is hosted on the cloud, which is here, uh, and I will come back to the other side, but because all of the data is hosted on the cloud, it makes it easier for us to flex and scale up and down, depending on the demand for, for the data. And it's also easier to put the data onto the cloud for people to access. Mm -hmm. uh, going back to this slide, it just gives you an example, or it's a map of some of the data sets that we're making available. Mm -hmm. So you can see the level of complexity mm -hmm. that goes on behind the scenes but at the front end, we want to make it as seamless as possible for people to access the data. Right. So, what are the outcomes? So we have 14,000 developers re uh, registered, open data users registered to access our data. 
which is, as I say, powered nearly powers all, nearly 700 apps in, in uh, by TFO data. That's used by over 40 percent of Londoners. So the story is a good one, and we want to do more in this space. And just to give some examples, so we've started to create an ecosystem of startups, and so, some of the ones. So one example is we have one app developer that has about 25% of the market share of the of buses, bus information in London, and it's I think it's three people, three or four people, if that. So that's that's an important story. It's not just for the big players. You know, we're we're trying to engage with everyone. That concept or that principle of a level, level playing field is important. Um, then we do work with some of the bigger players because they have uh, they have a platform that has significant market reach. So it's in our interest to make sure that they're also using our data. And many of you may have used Android Play or Google or Apple Maps to, to, to get here today. So Apple Maps are listing some of our taxi rank information. They're also listing um, our so-called docking station information, uh, which hopefully will stimulate people to use a, a bike. Um, we also have, in some cases, data aggregators. So people that are taking our data, aggregating it, and they make it available in a format that works for Apple or, or, or any other uh, platform provider. We also formed a partnership with Twitter. Um, so uh, with Twitter, we, uh, there's a preferencing option on, on, on the left-hand side, which allows you to get information about disruption on the network. And we did this about two, two years ago now, I think. And then we slowly started to move in the, to the bots place. So you can see that how this is stimulating innovation. So we moved from something that, that was you selecting preferences to actually now uh, trying machine learning and bots. And it's, it's, it's helped our journey too, because TFO now is thinking about, oh, I have started to develop bots. And we've started to work with Facebook in, in that area. And the other one is the Waze partnership. So Waze, for those of you that don't know Waze, uh, is a crowdsourced tool that mainly focuses on, uh, that does focus on the road network. Um, our partnership with Waze is, 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 is a data partnership, so we give them data and they give us data back. We don't have a conversation about we'll be paying X amount of pounds for your, for your data, so it's a transaction. Mm -hmm. And it helps both parties. And a couple of examples that I'd like to flag up. Recently we ran a trial with them. On, uh, so, so, so the Blackwall Tunnel connects South and North London. Mm. And quite, uh, one reason why the tunnel has congestion is someone may break down because of lack of fuel, because there might be a tail back, and by the time you get to the tunnel, you run out of fuel. So what we did with Waze was we targeted messages uh, based on where people are. So some people would have been near a petrol station approaching the Blackwall Tunnel, and as a result, they would see this message on the screen. And what we saw from the analytics is some people are rerouting back to a petrol station, which suggests that some of them may have been close to breaking, uh, running out of fuel, which again, from a city point of view, has avoided uh, serious congestion taking place. The other example with Waze is they provide, uh, through crowdsourcing, they get incident information. So there are instances where we might get information back uh, quicker than other, uh, from Waze, quicker than other channels. So we'll then validate the information that we receive from Waze and, 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 and immediately make some operational changes. Again, to make sure that, that there's as minimum dis, minimal, minimal level of disruption. And we've also uh, have, have worked with Google in the past. So for those of you that, that use an Android device, you may get some proactive notifications before a major event's taking place in London. And then we work with Google to highlight where the route might be and where the levels of disruption might be. So again, people are using Google to plan their journeys and hopefully not be disrupted by events taking place in London, whether that's Pride Lon uh, pr the Pride Parade or whether it's uh, the, the, the London Marathon and other major events, because in London there are major events uh, very regularly. Right, so I've spoken quite a lot about customer information. The other area that where, where we see lots of innovation is beyond customer information around the future of mobility. And again, open data will play a role in that space. So what we're thinking about is by using our data, you know, how, how do we, uh, data is one component to create a product, but how do you curate new ideas in the city in a safe and secure way? Uh, and, and we're currently looking at processes. So some of you may have seen the test bed or heard about the test bed in London for connected and autonomous vehicles in North Greenwich and uh, the Olympic Park. 
So we're trying to develop new test beds, new access to people, access to systems, which allows people to develop trials and proof of concepts. And clearly data is a big enabler for, an enabler for people to develop those products. It's also not just about the future of mobility, it's about how can we be innovative right now. And, and that is how can emerging tech help our business run more efficiently? And data is one, again one component of that. But how do, we, how, we, how do we start incubating as a business? How, how do we get ideas in that may be 60 to 80 percent formed and perhaps it change the way we're doing certain things? So that's an area we're also currently looking at. And that has to start with defining clear problem statements. So in terms of key considerations around open data, the first thing that, is, that should be considered is engagement. So how do we, you know, it's not just about making your data available and then keeping, you know, then hoping that good products are developed. There's, there needs to be a two-way dialogue. And that's about developing partnerships with whether it's startups, whether it's the larger corporates, whether it's SMEs. How do you work together? That requires an investment. You have summits, you could have a blog, you could have forums. But engage early. Uh, the earlier you engage, the, the more flexible people will be t in, in terms of their product development. But also be honest and be clear about expectations. Uh, and that dialogue is important. Organizations, large corporates, uh, you know, sometimes it can take a while to come back to a startup. And a startup may want a response within a day or two. So it's how, again, do you have that honest dialogue to say, uh, it might take us slightly longer to come back on a particular idea. It's also about curating ideas. And, and we've touched on many of these, or I've touched on many of these earlier. But how do you move from problem statements, access to the right tools, to developing a PLC? And how do you do this in a safe space? Uh, proof of concept, sorry. So you, you develop a, a proof of concept or a minimum viable product. Um, but also be prepared to, to, you know, to, to try it, but also be prepared that it might not work, or you might need to tweak it, or you may need to start again. But how do you do that efficiently? Um, also, and, and this particularly applies to our open data activity, you need a champion at board level. So we've got, we've got someone who sits on an executive committee that is championing open data which really helps, because that helps to drive the culture change in the organization. But also, you have to be absolutely clear that it's, this isn't about the tech. This is about the customer outcome that you're trying to drive. Otherwise, you can get really excited by the tech, and it's shiny, but it doesn't have an impact on the customer. So you need, you need to start with the customer first. You need to engage at the design stage. So going back to data, quite often, uh, a procurement life cycle can be quite long. So how do you engage right at the beginning to say, we will have da data requirements in the process? And, and it could be the procurement cycle could be a year, could be two years, could be three years if you're building big trains. Well, how do you talk at the, right at the beginning to say, these will be my data requirements? And how do you try and future-proof them, thinking five or 10 years ahead, which is difficult? You need champions across the business. You, ne you need people that can support you on this journey. And we found that in our sm small team, our, our, t our teams, you know, it's, it's, not, it's not massive, so we're working with people across the organization. Um, I think a big area in transport, in particular, <coughs> is about setting data standards. So how can you help the, the startup ecosystem or the, or the ecosystem out there to work with the same data standards and data sets, types of data sets? Otherwise, what happens is Paris, London, New York, and whatever other city you want to mention, if you've all got different data standards, it makes it really hard to standardize your product which then makes it difficult to scale. And also, finally, how do you give access to the right people? <coughs> Quite often we found that some of the startups and SMEs just want access to people, maybe the policy experts, maybe specific individuals around the technology, as opposed to wanting other things. So again, how do you make yourself available? And then uh, an area that's, that's, in, uh, that's really important is the routes to market. So you've got to the proof of concept stage, or you've developed a product, a minimum viable product, and you might find it works well in your organization. So I'm thinking here beyond customer information. It could be a product that you may want to bring into your organization. Well, how do you move from an innovative idea to something that you actually procure, you procure or it's in your business? So there are various routes to market that we're currently exploring, and, and, and I think once we crack that, that will enable us to engage even better with the SME and startup community, which is, how do we define our problem statements? How do we turn that? How do we curate that? 
how do you turn that into a proof of concept? And then ultimately, how do you bring it into your organization? And that's something we need to look at. So that's the main things I'll, I'll say on, on open data and, and the SME engagement. There's one other point I want to make. So currently, uh, there's a London Smart Plan that's being developed and a listening exercise has been kicked off. So it's been, ma it's been overseen by Theo Blackwell, who's a Chief Digital Officer at the, at the Greater London Authority. Um, and the London Smart Plan will launch as part of London Tech Week later, later this year in, in June. But th the exercise is focusing on a series of themes and it wants to hear from the likes of yourselves on what you think about these themes. And there's more information on the, on the, on the GLA, on the london.gov.uk website. But there's five main themes there. One is around citywide collaboration and innovation. And that focuses on some of the things that I've talked about today. What does a new deal for city data look like? Um, what does world-class co connectivity mean for London? And, uh, and, uh, and, uh, and, and also, what, what is the right level of digital capability and skills that we need, thinking about the next few years ahead? And finally, what does openness and responsible tech mean? So there's a series of questions that are asked on the, on the, on the website. And, and by all means, please feel free to respond to them uh, through smart at london.gov.uk. So I think that's what I'll say. So thank, thank you for listening. Okay. Thanks, Rakesh. That was great. Um, I think we, we, we've got a bit of time for questions. Um, and I think I'd like to start off, if sure. that's all right. I wrote down lots of them, which were probably too <coughs> geeky. But I think it's really interesting from what you were saying. It's clear that you've, you've got a lot of excitement. There's a lot of exciting things going on. And I just wanted to know, basically, what, what's the thing maybe this year that, that you're most excited about from TfL's perspective, whether it's the partnerships with data, the new mobility services, or the increasing use of data? Yeah. I, th I think one area is how do we, you know, if I, if, I, if I touch on the SME engagement, the startup engagement, how do we move the relationship which has been us just making the data available? to actually developing new products and services that potentially TfL could bring internally. So the way we've procured in the past, and our supply chain you know, does a really good job, but we've, we've, we've procured in a certain way. How do, we bring a, how do we bring startups and SME into that value chain? And if we can crack that, I think that would that, be a good success. I think a lot of people will be uh, interested to find out how you get on with that. So uh, keep us in. Um, would anyone in the room, do we have any questions to start with? Okay, we got loads, which is great. If I could give it to you first. I just wonder whether you, uh, I assume you probably are uh, cooperating with KTN Knowledge Transfer Network and Nesta, yeah. because that's really, really important in innovation. Yeah, it's, it's, it's a good question. So just, just this week, we've done, we've done some work with, with, with Nesta mm -hmm. on, on drones in the city, what, you know, in thinking about the future. Mm -hmm. So yes, we, you know, we work with Nesta, we work with a lot of the academic institutes mm -hmm. and the KTNs, because again, there's lots of value there. Mm -hmm. Hands again, thanks. Yes, are you using, by, by the way, two questions, yeah. health observation in the city, uh, are you exploring the data from satellite? One. Yep. Second, how you comply with the GDPR now? Because you see, now you have organization, ACME, and uh, you need to comply with this type of a GDPR. How you do? Yeah. The, so the satellite one, I'm not sure, fr frankly speaking. Uh, unless Theo, you, you, you know. So, but in terms of GDPR, so this comes back to the principles that we've set out when we make the data available. It's got to be legally compliant. It's got to be technically doable, and it's got to be commercially right. And, p and within that, there's also a reputational piece, which is, is it, right for, for, is it right for TfL to make the data available? The data we've made available to date has been anonymous. So it's about journey time. So it's some of the timetable information. It's about where the bus is. It's where the level of traffic on the road. So at the moment, we do not make any personal data available. Thank you. I uh, kind of have an awkward question, I guess. Uh, uh, given that you, you spoke about economic value, but you also spoke about having uh, less cash going forward, and I want uh, you're sharing data with a lot of people who are going to take advantage of it, and sometimes that's uh, to the advantage of 
services you offer, so buses and tube. Uh, sometimes that's going to be used by people that maybe might cannibalize profits, so perhaps um, uh, dockless bicycles. And then there'll also be instances maybe where people are using your data that, in, that isn't aligned with your policy. So maybe like perhaps driverless vehicles or electric vehicles. And I just wonder how you kind of are going to make that work going forward. Are you happy to give, are you truly happy to give everyone your data? Yeah, so, so if, if, if I wind back 10 years, and, and, uh, and where, where we were 10 years ago, is we're making our dates, we're listing all of our data on our website. So timetable information, for example, we're publishing it on our website. And what we found was people were scraping that data and quite often getting it wrong. So as a result, customers were consuming information that was inaccurate <coughs> and then having a bad transport experience, which, was, which probably was one of the drivers that uh, made us make the data available. So I think this comes back to the previous point is we have a clear process to make uh, we, when we decide what data we make available. And part of that is we will be going through that exercise. So going back to your point, if we think there's a risk for the city by making that data available, we'll obviously go through a massive diligent process to make sure we get the right data out there. Thanks for the uh, presentation. Um, yeah. I was assuming that JP API that we saw, or JP was for Journey Planner, yep. and that suggests a, a particular use case for the API. Um, is it also possible to get significant historical information through the API? And if so, uh, what kind of granularity? Yeah. I'm, I'm looking to Theo. Uh, Not really. Yeah. I mean, we focus, yeah. we focus very much on real time in the API, um, but we have got things like AxStats, which gives you kind of uh, collision data going back to, I think, 2005. So we have some, but um, we also have data stored in S3 buckets, um, which you can we link to from our website. And in that, we have things like cycle hire uh, data for journeys. And that goes back several years to, to probably the beginning of the scheme, actually. Uh, and we're looking at releasing kind of more of our um, TAPS data, so Oyster and Contactless. Um, that's on the cards. Um, but it will be aggregated and anonymized. So we've gone very through very kind of stringent privacy um, discussions on what we can and can't release. Mm -hmm. But yeah, it's definitely something we need to look at more in the future, <coughs> I think. Thank you. Hi. Hi. Um, so I've got a slightly opposite problem question, yeah, which yep. is I'm doing some consulting for a county sports partnership in Gloucestershire. Right. So we're yeah. looking, and we're looking at launching quite an innovative new yep. way of uh, driving sports and activity. Yep. And obviously active travel and yep. active um, design are part of that. Yep. Um, we are just beginning to look at the data and the yep. data infrastructure and yep. how we share it and yep. what's important, but we have minute budgets yep. compared with TfL. If okay. you were to give advice to what is essentially yep. uh, an underfunded project, yep. what, wh where would you start with the data, the sharing? Yep. What's the absolute yeah. basics? So, uh, yeah, it's, uh, it's, it's a good question. And I, th I think the starting point is you've got to start with the outcome. So what outcome are you trying to realize? And then working back from there, what do you think are the enablers? And my advice would be start small, so be and then be iterative. I think if you start with a big invest in a big cloud, big backend technology, it's it will be expensive. So how do you do it in a small way? And <coughs> engage with the ecosystem. So use some of the contacts that you have at the ODI, and d develop a PLC at a very design stage, very early stage. So what what could we want? And then that will define what data you should be making available. When you started opening up your data, you were releasing data which you'd either gathered for your own internal purposes or for your, what I call your traditional customers, I suppose, to publish yep. lots of timetables. You've now got a, a very much varied and wider group of customers, users, in your yep. open data users. Yep. So how do you find out what their requirements are in that a lot of them may just come and take your open data and you don't know who they are, you have no communication with them. And the following question is, to what extent are you now being driven by their requirements yeah. for you to either supply data yeah. or even collect data you, don't, you yeah. haven't done in the past? So, so, so I think the sweet spot has to be, does it support TfL's objectives in terms of the data we're making available? 
uh, and so that's got to be a starting point because we just won't make any data available if it doesn't serve the citywide goals. So I think that's the first point. I think the second point is we listen a lot. So it's through sessions like this and other sessions to say, here are our goals. What type of data should we be making available to you? Mm -hmm. And be, before we do and invest lots of money in it, again, let's just work with some sample sets mm -hmm. and see what value you can create. And, and can we get the vision that you're trying to develop, you know, the product that you're trying to develop? So I think there's a couple of points. What, one is it's got to support the citywide goals. Secondly, it's got, to, it's got to be part of an engagement process. And it's not just for an individual or an individual company. We've got to think about the wider use case. And thirdly, when we do it, we'll do it really iteratively. Just, just to add to that, I think one of the key, key things that's changing at the moment is that if we're starting to see data as a product and using product management uh, methodologies around developing that product. So we bring in a third party knowledge, as Rikesh said, we also talk to our internal team, so our digital team, for example, what they need for the stuff that they're working on, like the chatbots that they've been working on, the new digital displays. So it's using that product management methodology to shape it. Yeah. Thanks. Um, to what extent your team has an equivalent in City Hall? Because it feels to me that you know, you, you, you've done an excellent job yeah. uh, as a user. Yeah, uh, uh, thank you. Um, and I can see where there's a rude disruption now yeah but if there's a planned work in the same road next week which of course is nothing to do with you yeah. but the city hall would know yeah. or the borough would know yeah. then it doesn't necessarily feed into your system so yeah. to what extent you use it for you your own you, you could get the data do, yeah. do you have that engagement in city hall because yeah. it feels to me that's yeah. kind of a missing link so, so so theo in terms of if there's road planned road works do, do we make that data available for the whole of london yeah we do and um, there's a system that uh, logs all the permits for roadworks that is um, a TFL system actually uh, and that data gets um, put into our traffic feed where it affects the traffic on the road um, and there's also the London Works website as well so you can look at every single work by every utility company or whoever or borough um, so yeah that, that data is, yeah. is in, in there as well. Uh, 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 and I think this is also part of the London Smart Plan Oops, sorry, break anything. So, so that's where Theo Blackwell is saying, how do the public agencies work better together? So there is a London data store that we link to. So the, 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 the idea that, that we're fully supportive of is how do we link some of the data that the borough is making available and the other public authorities are making available work together? Uh, which kind of uh, road accident data do you have? And uh, they are integrated with uh, um, weather, road pavement conditions, uh, in order to yeah. allow road safety auditor yeah. to solve or identify a specific problem uh, related to this kind of uh, black spot. Yeah. So, 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 so my understanding is the data around road collisions yeah. we receive from the Metropolitan Police. Uh, so w we publish the data that they give us. Okay. Yeah. But I, in terms of the level of detail, how they, what they gather, I'm not 100% sure. But I can, we can find out. Yeah. yeah, I think we've got a question from Twitter and then we might have time for another one in the room. The voice of Twitter. Okay. Yeah. Oh, wow. <laughs> uh, we've got a question from Tom Forth from ODI Leeds. They're live streaming the talk from there today. Hello. Um, <laughs> how much less would London have achieved if transport had been re deregulated as it was elsewhere? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah, I mean, w what, what, what's, so we have a franchised model in London. Um, what's helped is us having clear standards <laughs> about the type of data we want and the systems they need. It's, it's a difficult question to answer, but I think if you, but common sense says that if you've got multiple operators who aren't integrated, well, then they will have different standards, which as a result means it will be harder to deliver. Yeah, I think there's uh, having yeah. doing work in yeah. uh, bus bus operators yeah. around the country, and there yeah. being loads of them. I think also having that central driving, yeah. uh, like yeah. goals yeah. within them. I yeah. think that's quite yeah. quite a useful point. Do we have another question in the room? Do we? Yeah. I'm not sure I need this, but hello. Yeah. Uh, I'm working at Cabinet Office on opening Master Map 
um, making right. maps open. Right. Um, and I wanted to ask a boring question about money. Yep. Presumably, you collect all of this data for your own operations. Um, so yep. it's, it's not a... Um, a, it's not a cost in your in, in itself, yeah. but how much extra does it cost you to make it open, and how do you justify yeah. that in your budgets, given the budgetary yeah. constraints you talked about earlier? Yeah, so, so it, it, I think the starting point is our website. So this data was primarily, at the f in the first instance, was primarily for our website. So we're, we're, plug it, we're plugging this data in to TfL's website anyway, so that cost is there. But what we're doing, arguably, as a very successful byproduct, is now making this data available for everyone else. So the actual the cost to make that available isn't significant. The core cost is bringing the data in. Cool. I think we have time for one more question. If we have one, no. Well, okay. um, I think yeah. I think we'll wrap up now. So uh, thank you very much for coming. Thank you no, very no much, problem. Rakesh. Uh, if everyone would join me yeah. in giving Rakesh a round of applause. Thank you. Thank you. And Theo as well. Yes. <laughs> <laughs>